Um, we're going to get started with the Quran recitation from Zakaria Rahman. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والمرسلات عرفا فالعاسفات عسفا والناشرات نشرا فالفارقات فرقا فالملقيات ذكرا عذرا أو نذرا إنما توعدون لواقع فإذا النجوم طمست وإذا السماء فرجت وإذا الجبال نسفت وإذا الرسل أقتت لأي يوم نجنت ليوم الفصل وما أدراك ما يوم الفصل وين يومئذ للمكذبين ألم نهلك الأولين ثم نتبعهم الآخرين كذلك نفعل بالمجرمين وين يومئذ للمكذبين ألم نخلقكم من ماء مهين فجعلناه في قرار مكين إلى قدر معلوم فقدرنا فنعم القادرون وين يومئذ للمكذبين ألم نجعل الأرض كفاتا أحياء وأمواتا وجعلنا فيها رواسي شامخات وأسقيناكم وأسقيناكم ماء فراتا ويل يومئذ للمكذبين انطلقوا إلى ما كنتم به تكذبون انطلقوا إلى ظل ذي ثلاث شعب لا ظليل ولا يغني من اللهب إنها ترمي بشرر كالقصر كأنه جمالة صفر ويل يومئذ للمكذبين صدق الله العظيم And for the translation, uh, by those winds set, set forth successively, and those blowing violently, and those scattering rain clouds widely, and by those angels fully dis distinguishing truth from falsehood, and those delivering uh, revelation, ending excuses and giving warnings, surely what you are promised will come to pass. So when the stars are put out, and the sky is torn apart, and the mountains are blown away, and the messenger's time to testify comes up? For which day has all this been set? For the day of final decision. And what will make you realize what the day of decision is? Woe on that day to the deniers. Did we not destroy earlier, earlier disbelievers? And we will make the later disbelievers follow them. This is how we deal with the wicked. Woe on that day to the deniers. Did we not create you from a humble fluid, placing it in a secure place? In a secure place until an appointed time, we perfectly ordained its development. How excellent are we in doing so? Woe on that day to the deniers. Have we not made the earth a lodging for the living and the dead, and placed upon it towering firm mountains and giving you fresh water to drink? Woe on that day to the deniers. The disbelievers will be told, 
Proceed into that fire which you used to deny. Proceed into the shade of smoke which rises in three columns, providing neither coolness nor shelter from the flames. Indeed, it hurls sparks as big as huge castles and as dark as black camels. Woe on that day to the deniers. Zakhalaf. Jazakallah khair for the beautiful recitation you like here. Um, we're just going to start with the purpose of MSA. Um, so the purpose of Rutgers MSA will be to provide all members of the Rutgers community with an understanding of Islam according to the Quran and the practices of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Rutgers MSA is committed to the unity of all Muslims standing under the banner of there is no God but Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his final messenger. Uh, I'm sure many of you guys know who Imam Safwan is, but I'm just going to give an uh, intro anyway. Um, Imam Safwan Eid is the son and student of renowned Islamic scholar and theolo theologian, Dr. Imam Talal Eid. Imam Safwan graduated with his master's degree in Islamic studies and leadership from Bayan Claremont School of Theology. Under the guidance of Sheikh Jihad Brown, he wrote his thesis titled, From Ijma to Ijtema towards the development of institutionalized ijtihad in North America. A model of communal consensus building based on the lexical methodology of Imam Malik's famed book, al Muwatta. He also holds bachelor degrees in economics and women slash gender studies from the University of Massachusetts and is known for his advocacy work in economic reform and social justice. Imam, I, Imam Safwan most recently served as the Imam of the Islamic Center of uh, Sajma <laughs> in Michigan. Oh, I lost. All right. <laughs> we, we can uh, we can just continue with the talk. <laughs> they asked me for the the brief bio. They asked me for the long bio. I gave them the brief bio, and then they said they want the long one. So there you go. All right. Oh, nice, fancy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilma. And what that means is, O oh Allah, uh, bless us and allow us to benefit by what you have taught us and to increase us in knowledge, right? That this idea that not all knowledge is actually good for you. Um, and this is something that I think in college is interesting because this is generally a place where people become expanded or constricted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in the Quran, وَاللَّهُ يَقْبِدُ وَيَبْسُطُ وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ That Allah expands you and constricts you and unto Him you will return, right? وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ So this idea that the highs and lows of life are actually demanded of you by your Creator that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes for you your highs just as He writes for you your lows. And both of these things are essential to your development. Right? And so many of us, right, we become addicted to highs, right? And then we go and we hide away during the lows. But part of spiritual development and it is something that we all have to aspire towards. It is a path. It's not just something where we snap our fingers and it happens. Um, but it's where you can see God even before you see the high or the low. And this is something maybe we'll talk about a little bit later on. But the topic for today. Uh, uh, you guys graciously chose for me is dunya versus akhirah. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhana الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْأَزْوَاجَ كُلَّهَا He said, how amazing is the one who created all of the pairs. Like he literally created everything in pairs. Right? So, if you're full, well, you're not hungry. If you're rich, well, you're not poor. If you're sad, well, you're not happy. Right? That you're always traveling between a binary reality. Right? You're busy, and you're bored. You get bored, you say, I wish I had something to do. You get too busy, you say, I wish I could just take a break, go on vacation. Right? That this constant pursuit of oneness while running between two realities at all times. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is literally saying, Subhan al-ladhi khalaq al-azwaja kullaha. How amazing is the one who created and designed the human life that they're always running between these things in every single part of their life. And so then he says, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى Allah." He says, run to Allah. Because what is Allah? Right? He's oneness. It's literally one. He is the only one, right, that exists amongst creator and creation. Everything else is in pairs. And so the only way to opt out of duality is to invest in unicity, to invest in oneness. That is the only way that you can finally tell yourself, well, I'm not sad nor happy. I'm a servant of God. I'm not rich nor poor. I receive gifts of God, right? That you finally get to remove this obsession with yourself out of the equation that is when you become free. Because otherwise you are shackled between one or the other at every point of your life. And so, does, that, does this make sense? Is everyone with me? Anyone have any questions? Pretty, pretty clear, right? Alright, really cool. Do you like this idea? Yeah? Okay. I just want to make sure. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah Hud, I believe it's verse 16. If someone wants to verse, check me. Uh, I'm not Zakir Naif though. I, I don't do this. Like I'm not going to give you the verse number for every single... You guys maybe are too young to guess you know Zakir Naif is. Okay, just making sure I'm like... I'm actually not that much older than you guys, but I just turned 30, alhamdulillah. And Allah, you know, bless me in my 30s, just as He blesses you all in whatever age that you all are. Um, but I, I went to college not too long ago, um, and uh, when I got to my college, the MSA had like five people in it. And what happened was, we didn't really like what was going on with the MSA, so myself and my best friend, uh, Shadik Purkar, if you're watching, shout out to Shadik. Um, we barged into an MSA meeting, and we had written this like five-page paper on why the MSA needs elections. And so I remember at that meeting, I stood up and I was like, you know, Sayyidul Qawmi Khadimuhum. I was like. The, the, the true leader of a people is their servant. You know, we, we can just sit and, you know, collect board titles and just sit on our funding and what it may be. And, um, you know, but alhamdulillah, we made an impact. And so we became president and vice president. And the second we took our MSA office, we devised this strategy, which was to table in the 
the main hallway of the campus center for two weeks straight. And so we sat at these tables, we had all the iPads and tablets and everything out, laptops, and we would give people candy if they signed up. Now usually, I don't know if this is like this at Rutgers, but signing up for a club at your MSA or a club at your college is actually quite tedious. Like you have to go to a special website, then you have to like sign up, you have to log in, then sign up to become a member of a club. Maybe it's, I don't know, is it like that for you guys? It's pretty easy. You just go on an app and just like, yeah, so we weren't quite in the app age yet, I guess. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a terrible interface. Um, so what we did was we would literally sign people up on the spot. We wouldn't tell people like, hey, sign up for our MSA or whatever. We would sign them up on the spot and give them candy. Within two weeks, we went from 20 members to over 400 members. And we became the biggest organization on campus. And our budget went from like $250 to like $20,000. And we held some amazing events and we won organization of the year. We actually beat out, I don't know if this is, they have one of these here. We beat out one of the biggest national medical organizations, uh, Phi Delta Epsilon, and they were really mad. It was awesome. <laughs> they were just, they were just so pissed off. It was amazing. Best feeling in the world. But, anyways, alhamdulillah, I just have to share my epic MSA story because you know I'm here at, at a college, so alhamdulillah. Thanks. But, anyways, back to the topic. Uh, Yeah. I just have like rap lyrics running in my head. So it's like back to the topic that I own. So I was like, wait a second, I'm an email. I probably shouldn't do that. It's okay. I'm the that. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Hud about verse 16, where he says, Bada Urdu Billahi Min Shaitan al Rajim, Man kana yuridu al hayat al dunya wa zinataha. He says, whoever wants the life of this dunya, and its beauty, he says, He says, we give them success in whatever it is that they're seeking after. And they will not suffer in regards to what they want at all. What does this mean? Allah is saying, if you want the dunya, what is he going to do? He's going to say, no, you can't have it? Well, what does he say? What did I just tell you guys? What is it? He give it to you. Right? Allah is saying, if you want the dunya, I'll give it to you. No problem. Then he says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَيْسَ لَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا النَّارِ But those people, right, in the Akhirah, they will have nothing but the fire. And so this idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you want, He can give you an advance on everything in your life. You get it all right now. يُحِبُّونَ الْعَجِلَ Right? And so this idea then, that if Allah loves me, is He gonna just leave me to myself? And just give me whatever I want? Or, is He going to continue to expand and constrict me who goes to the gym here? Any gym people? Zaim. What's up, man? Zaim, Zaim said he doesn't, uh, he doesn't bring any uh, clothes to change into after he goes to the gym. Stuff for the lot. Good, change your ways. <laughs> so that's great, alhamdulillah. So this idea then that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He 
finds it critical for us to go through expansion and constriction. As in, you'll be having an awesome day. You'll feel like, boy, man, I ate all this protein. I'm feeling great. I got a workout in. Everything in school is going good. Everything at work's going good. Everything at family life's going good. You might even send a picture on like your family WhatsApp group, and then your like random distant cousin will be like, "Look at this guy. You know, he ate." two boiled eggs for breakfast while we're all fasting. And then you're like, dang, I felt good. I know that was a really random example, but that's what I'm here for. Um, and so now you're constricted. You went to like super expanded, and now you, you're sitting and thinking about all your haters, right? Or, you know, I, I don't, do haters exist? That's another Make sure that's the next topic for our lecture, inshallah. Do haters really exist? Um, and so this is, you know, when we start to realize that our, our good days and our bad days are both from Allah and they're both essential for our development, we change as human beings. There's no way you could be the same. Because you're trying to feed your daughter, you know, for dinner, you're trying to feed her breakfast or dinner, I should say, let's, let's say a good dinner, some kebabs or something. And she just refuses to eat them and all she wants is a lollipop. And you say, sorry, you can't until you finish your dinner. And then all of a sudden she's like, you're the worst dad ever, I never want to see you again. And then it's just like, wow, things just got real. But... If you were to see her as some type of independent actor who is just doing whatever she wants in the world, then the way that you see the world is fundamentally fragmented. You just think there's a bunch of random people running around this earth doing whatever they want, hurting whoever they want, and life is just chaotic and crazy. And so by necessity, what that means is that you don't know how to have any meaning in your life. If there's all of these independent actors, i.e. human beings, who are just doing whatever they want at random, then, then life has no meaning. Life gets all of its meaning from one driver of reality. And therefore, I don't see my daughter saying she hates me as her act. I see it as an act of God who wishes for me to be constricted in this moment. And I know that constriction is good for me because I've been getting expanded. And it's about time for a tune-up, for an adjustment. And so in that sense, you get to see Allah as Rabbul Alameen. Can anyone tell me what Rabb means? Let's see it. All smart people. Yeah, back there. Lord. Lord? Okay. Yeah. Master. Master. My goodness, y'all live in like in the 1600s or something. <laughs> What else? <laughs> yeah? No, I didn't mean to make fun of you guys. You guys say anything you like. I'll only make fun of you a little bit. Okay. So, Rabb, you Rabbi, right? The Rabb is the one, that's why they call the mother Rabbatul Bayt, right? The Rabb is the one, right, who raises people, right? So Allah is Rabbul Alameen. The first way that He introduces you to Himself is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise and thanks are absolutely due to the one who raises and uplifts, expands, and constricts 
العالمي. All of creation. Right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is literally, He's your Rabb, as in, not only does He feed you and give you drink and, and give you parents and clothe you and shelter you, He's literally in every micro moment nourishing you, right, with exactly the ingredients you need, right, to come to understand reality, right? And that is the reality, the nature of things, the nature of Him, the nature of yourself, right? And all of these things are entirely essential, but most people have not opted into Him as their Rabb. So they don't know, right? So like you can have a personal trainer, right? But if you have your personal trainer and you're just like, why is he making me do this ridiculously tedious back workout, right? Then you're just gonna be like, I don't, I don't know if he's the right personal trainer for me, right? Maybe I need a new one. Or maybe I should just go on YouTube and see how I can fare on my own with all these random videos. Then you end up in the hospital three days later. That's okay, though. Yeah. And so, when we accept Allah as the Rabb, then nothing in life really should surprise you. Because this is the nature, the nature of the dunya. Is that you will be constricted. Right? You will go home and go under the bed sheets and cry yourself to sleep. That is the nature of the dunya. Right? And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself. Why are you smiling, bro? Why are you smiling, bro? You think you're exempt from crying under your bed sheets? <laughs> Well, those who think they're, they, are, they are exempt are in for rude awakenings. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you all, keep you all safe. Um, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, literally cried until his beard was soaked and his shirt was soaked. How many people have cried that much before? All missing out, man. <laughs> so this idea, though, that like he knew Allah, and he knew that Allah had a thing called destiny, but even then he still allowed reality to drive him to the point of uncontrollable tears. How how is that possible, right? Because usually. People were like, oh, everything's from God. So that means that I'm very happy with everything that God does. And so even if I were to lose a child or I were to get hurt or fail something, or, then that would mean that I'm like immune to it and I'm numb to it, right? And so the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. He was not perfectly engaged with like Jannah in the sense that you might think or with Allah in the sense that you might think. He was engaged with Allah through everything that was around him, through the dunya itself. And so the dunya is not this world. The dunya is everything that is disconnected from God, right? And where does that occur? Because in reality, everything is connected to God. He created everything, designed everything, every speck, detail, particle is perfectly put together by Allah. So He's not disconnected from anything. 
but it's your heart that becomes deluded into thinking that things are independent of God, that they could be disconnected from Him, that you could pursue it without pursuing Him, right? And so it's really the heart that comes to see the world in a way in which life is foggy, life is confusing, right? The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam saw Allah in all things. And I know a lot of people say that, but they have no clue how to explain it. So I'm going to tell you right now how to do so. As Ibn Atta Allah Sakandari Rahimahullah says in his hikam, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created all things, right? But the reality of those things, as Ibn Atta says, Al Kaun Kulluhu Vulma. He says, the universe in its entirety and all things in it, is in absolute darkness. Now when he says darkness, what does he mean? He means it's in a state of non-existence. Right? Because Allah had to bring it to existence. Right? And so he says, everything is in the state of non-existence. وَإِنَّمَا إِنَارُهُ وُجُودَ الْحَقِّفِي and what gives it light, what animates it, is the presence of Al-Haqq inside of it. The presence of Allah inside of that thing. Does that mean He's literally inside of it? No, that's ridiculous. His knowledge, His design, His will, His desire, right? That is what actually lights up a thing, right? And so, it's very easy for me, for instance, to look at this speaker here, and I can look at it, and before I even see the speaker, I can see a lot. Because behind, behind that thing, right, is the knowledge, right, of how to build it. But go even more abstract, right? The knowledge of hearing, right? And even from your ears, you would know that Allah has knowledge of symmetry. Because it would be pretty funny if we were all walking around with two noses on our side, or like three noses, or we have just like a circle of noses. All things that Allah creates, we can see His knowledge of not only physical things, we see the knowledge of abstract reality. So we can deduce a lot of things about Allah by just looking at the things that He creates, right? And so the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, right, when he saw his son Ibrahim dying right between his arms. And he's telling the Sahaba, you know, that the eyes tear and the heart grieves, but the, but the, the tongue will not say what is displeasing to Allah. That's because he's not seeing, right? He's not seeing just his son but he's seeing everything that Allah put into that son of his. And everything that Allah is taking away in that son of his. And everything that he will have to deal with, right? By not having a son in a misogynist society of the Quraysh. Now these words, they don't mean much, but if you bury daughters, then it's not hard to, not hard to see where, where you stand on things. Um, and so 
this idea that I know what Allah is doing, I know why He is doing it, I understand some of these things, and it's deeply painful to go through it. But on top of all of that, I know that I need this, but I don't necessarily know why. But I know that Allah, just as He constricts me, He's going to expand me again. And when you get expanded, you also get to feel that too, right? And so, for instance, a lot of times you see people like get complimented. And they'll be like, no, no, no compliment you. And they're like squirming around and like they're going to go hide in the corner somewhere because somebody complimented. They don't know how to take compliments. But what if the person that complimented you, what if you didn't see it as them doing it? What if you knew that that compliment was actually from Allah? And Allah wants you to feel good. He's, he's ready for to expand you. But don't worry, he's going to come and constrict you again. But that's okay too, right? So instead of fighting the highs and the lows, right? You learn, cliche, but you learn to go with the flow, right? And so that's why the Prophet Muhammad said, um, he said, and mu'min hayyin. He said, the believer is easy. They're easy going. Layin. They're, they go with the flow. They're, they're good towards others. They're easy going with others. You want to go grab pizza? Sure. Would love to do that. I wonder what, what you know, gifts Allah has in store for me at, at, when we go and get pizza. It is an optimism that is unshakable. But it's not an optimism that is built on delusion. It's an optimism that's built on a genuine admiration of Allah and whatever He has written for you. And so that's kind of what I wanted to start this conversation with is that the akhirah versus dunya concepts and like deen and dunya, these are all spiritually immature framings of life. I'll tell you that right now. And I don't blame anyone for who picked the topic. It is a topic. It needs to be talked about. But I will tell you that these types of frameworks where it's like, I'm on my deen, but now let me move on from this deen and get some dunya and then I'll mix a little deen with dunya and I'll mix a little akhirah with dunya it's nonsense um, but yes there are decisions to be made and the decision that needs to be made is Why would I not want to know everything I can possibly know about the most fascinating being that created the entire cosmos and everything in it? That created you, right? Why would you not want to know everything there is to know? Because Allah did not create you, right, to do, to check off his eternal task list, right? It's not what he created you for. He said he created you for ibadah, li'abudun. And then Ibn Abbas, the great mufassir of the Qur'an, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, li'arifun. So they can know, right? That you can come to know Allah. The whole goal of your life is to know Allah. And behind every expansion and every constriction is knowledge of Him. Right? And so, this is a clear departure 
from dunya akhirah, you can know Allah now. You will know Allah later as well. And every moment that you come to know Allah in this world, wallahi, it's paradise. It's paradise. Paradise. But you perceive that your existence is only right here. But doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Uthkuruni, athkurukum? Think of me and I will think of you. If you think of me in a gathering, I will think of you in a gathering greater than the gathering you are in. So when Allah is thinking about you, He's remembering you when He's praising you. You have existence there. And there has no physical space. You've actually entered in, and I use the heart that is full of intellect and full of spiritual reasoning and direction and guidance and light, that it's not about how heavy my feet weigh upon this earth. but it's rather the magnitude of my earthquake in the heavens. Because Allah said, إِنَّكَ لَن تَخْرِقَ الْأَرْضِ He said, you cannot shake the earth, but you can shake the heavens. You can be truly a beautiful entity with Allah. in a space that has no space. And so this idea that I have to die to experience that, when that remembrance, that thought is not even occurring in a space in the first place, well, that's just ludicrous. Jannah, inshallah, is a place we will all deeply enjoy with the love that we have harvested from the seeds that we have planted for ourselves in this dunya. You will not touch the harvest of the Jannah, of Jannah, until you have deeply immersed yourself in the soil of the dunya. But that's the truth. The more akhirah you want, you better get real comfortable with getting yourself dirty in the soil of the dunya. Right? Not detaching from it. You don't need to detach yourself from it. You need to get closer to it than you have ever been. And you will see the beauty of Allah all around you. And your life will change. Right? And you will carry that light with you, inshallah, wherever you are. So, that is my rant. Should I stop? Or should we do questions? Or have I reached my limit? Questions? MashaAllah. Okay. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر بارك الله فيكم May Allah bless you all uh, Really had a nice time talking to you all But yeah, let's do some questions um, If anyone has any questions they'll feel free to ask if we have a Q&A form in the brothers and sisters group chats or group meetings um, But yeah, if you have any questions right now Raise your hand and ask.
Um, we'll just take the first question on the form. Um, so the first question is, how do you place Allah SWT's will and your free will on the same plane? How do you place Allah's will and your free will on the same plane? So we're talking about like a mathematical plane? Is that, is that what it was? Is it the same axis? Oh, that's nice. Um, so, my question to you is that if we believe that nothing can occur without the will of God, then the very thought of your own will is in itself a will of God. And that's why Allah says, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَيْ يَشَاءَ Allah. He said, you cannot want something except that Allah wants it. In, like we say, Allah, Right? So, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ You cannot want to do something إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah Unless Allah wants you to want it. So even your free will is built upon the inspiration of Allah to give you the thought that you would ever want something. So is that free? Is that free? Is it free? It's definitely not free. Whoever told you guys you have free will? My goodness. Um, let me tell you what you do have. You have intention. You can, you can intend for things. And your intentions are not like the way to salli salat al fajr. Not like I, I want to pray Fajr prayer. Intentions are the deep seed inside of your heart that really says who you are and what, what are the things that you aspire for and what you want, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once you send forward an intention, then Allah cooks up all that is within His power, which is everything, to make that thing happen, right? So if I say, I want to go to school, right? So Allah then facilitates everything for me to do that. Make sure the shower works properly, make sure my clothes are there, make sure that my body can move, make sure that the ride is, you know, whether a car or bus or train or whatever, right? Make sure that the teacher is actually gonna show up and she didn't cancel. Make sure that A, B, C, D all the way down. That even for one thing to happen in the world, requires an entire orchestra of tawfiq from Allah. Every single little thing. So you say I have a dictator of a country, right? That person's heart is, I really love power, I really love fame, I really love money, I really He would love that everyone knows and absolutely submits to my will and I want full control 
and I want to expand my empire, right? And I want, I want. But now let's say someone is in abject poverty, but really wants the same exact things as the dictator wants. But the dictator had, right, everything facilitated for him to reach the limits of their intentions. But the guy in poverty, although their hearts are exactly the same, nobody even knows who he is. No one even knows of the evil that's in his heart. Nobody knows. Because Allah did not facilitate reality for him to act upon those things. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as He tells us in Surah Yusuf, He says, إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَارَةٌ بِالسُّوءٍ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي Says, right, that the, the lower soul, right, that animalistic, impulsive spirit is immersed in evil, except for the rahmah of Allah except for the mercy of Allah. And so, literally, if you were to look at any person and think you were better than them, you would be wrong. Because all of the goodness in you is because Allah facilitated goodness for you. And had He not, you would have none. And so you have absolutely no justification to look at another human being and feel like, ah, oh, I'm this moral person. I'm such a good person. My goodness. If only they could see that trip that I did in, uh, mission trip I did in Mexico. Everyone knows how good I am. Sorry, I didn't mean to attack NGOs. It's too late for that. My apologies. You guys are so woke with that line. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so this idea then that I could have intentions, I could have good intentions, I could have bad intentions, but none of it will come to manifest except by the will of Allah, right? And so if I have any bad in me, Allah, we pray Allah will cover it. It won't. all of a sudden is what everyone knows you by. And all of the evil that you were actually immersed in, Allah covered it all, nobody knows nothing about it. And you're just sitting there riding your, your, your high horse, as they say, thinking about how moral and good you are. So that's 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 how you know we don't we don't have chins and we ask Allah to have rahmah upon us. That's why we ask for rahmah, we don't ask for justice. We ask Allah for mercy, we don't ask Allah for justice. Because if He were to take us to justice, then we wouldn't have much of a shot. We just hope that our good intentions Allah takes them and does a whole lot of good with them and our shortcomings, He covers them. And that's all we can hope for. Keep making good intentions. Keep thinking about your purpose. Keep thinking about really what's at the core, what's at the seed of your life. 
and, and plant more seeds and hope that they overwhelm, right, uh, the, uh, you know, that which is dead. Yeah, all right, next question. Uh, does anyone from the yeah. um, I just want to touch back on the dictator and the person in abject poverty. Oh, yes. Um, so say that they do have the same exact parts and have the same intentions. Yeah. But the man who was a dictator was actually able to hurt people. Meanwhile, the abject the person in abject poverty never even had the opportunity to. Yeah. Because Allah didn't realize. Exactly, yeah. Would both of them be punished because of their intentions? Like, would, or would the person who actually committed the act be punished because of physical consequences for it? So, it, it would depend on the full picture, but the one who actually caused harm would be punished more, but their hearts would, and, and we don't actually know if, if that dictator would be punished in the first place because we don't know if he were to change or what would happen to him or maybe Allah would forgive him. We don't know any of this stuff. But we could say theoretically, the one who caused real physical harm, right, would be dealt with more than the one who just simply had intentions. But that being said, there, there are theological repercussions to the things that are in your heart. So even if you never hurt someone, right, still one could, for instance, their heart would cause them to lose faith. And that is what they're ultimately be rewarded for or punished for, right? And so, yes, the, the, you could say that the one would have more, but if they both, if their evil both drove them, to theological faults, right, then that is what they would be judged of. From uh, Riyadh al-Salihin, Kitab al in the chapter of intentions, she mentions that there was an army going to destroy the Kaaba. And the, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says that the earth swallowed them up. And so Aisha immediately reacts, radiallahu anha, and she says, but some of the soldiers were just there because they were compelled to be there. Like some of them really wanted to destroy the Kaaba, but some of them are like innocent. They're just like following on, along. So how could they all be destroyed? And so he tells her, they will all face that punishment together, being swallowed by the earth, but then each one of them would be raised and judged by their intentions. So even though they're all doing the same physical act, they will, their intentions are going to be analyzed. And so this hadith is also a proof that this idea that the, the physical manifestation of reality, right, has absolutely no uh, impact on what will be judged on the Day of Judgment. Allah doesn't look at actions. He looks at hearts. Right? So even when you do something, right, it, it's the, the, the level of and the extent of the involvement of the heart that, that Allah is actually seeing in that action. Because He did the action. He facilitated the action. All you have is your intentions. You don't have anything else. Right? Is that good? Uh, anyone else have a question? I'm up. How are you, bro? How are you? How are we doing? You don't go to Rutgers. He doesn't go here. <laughs> <laughs> If life, if life is about highs and lows, how do we extend the highs and minimize the lows? Who said life is about highs? <laughs> <laughs> these, these questions are way too reductionist. Is that what, is that what you thought I said? That's what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> 
So this question also has in it a, a hidden assumption. And the hidden assumption is that I am able to know for myself that I need more highs and less lows. Because you're telling Allah, look at Allah, you don't know what I need. I'm telling you that I need more highs and less lows. Let me tell you. So here's the deal, Allah. You give me the highs, minimize the lows, I'll pray, I'll do, you know, we'll make it work. Have a relationship, this is a partnership. Right? That's not how it works, right? Allah is the Rabb. Allah is the creator. Allah is the master. My brothers from the 1600s. That when we give ourselves to Allah, we submit to Allah, right? Then that means that we're here for the highs and we're here for the lows. Now that being said, Allah says, if you are grateful, if you can handle the highs, I'll give you more highs. Because I don't want to see you suffer. Right? And so this idea is that, can you handle it? And what does it mean to, to handle it? And it really means that you're constantly in service to others to creation with everything that he gives you. So if he gives you a nice smile, you're using it. Every person that passes by, you make sure that they see that nice smile. If he, if he gives you some money, right, you're using that money for good things, whatever he gives you. If you use it, he give you more, right? But if he gives you that high and then you just sitting on it, no matter what it is, then it's time for some loads. Right? And you might be doing good things with the highs. Right? But then you come to think that the power is in you actually doing those good things so that you keep getting high so then you might get hit with some lows because you're forgetting you're starting to forget Allah in the equation and his facilitation and this is a long it's a long journey with many assumptions many hidden desires right and so the the, the spiritual journey um, is truly a beautiful thing um, but I would genuinely say um, that some would obviously tell you you would want a high and minimize the lows. Um, but I'm telling you something that's better than that. Um, which is to really, um, really try to remove yourself from the equation and let Allah do His thing. Let Allah go to work on you. See what He can produce out of you. So, that's my answer. Right, with that, we can close. Um, Jazakallah khair for this incredible talk. Um, I didn't get to finish the bio, but I believe uh, he's, gonna, he's the youth director at MCGP, so if you guys want to continue this discussion. And the director of the Sorry. The director director of Religious Affairs at MCGP. <laughs> um.